Hello and welcome back everybody. As always, I'm Necromanticer, and Faros and I are about to head on and start clearing through a little bit more of Elam Lois. I've got my standard three weapon setup, light, medium, and heavy for all my clearing needs. Hopefully it's going to bring a lot of engagement to the fight once I get into some PvP matches in New Game Plus, but that's not quite just yet. Right now, for the time being, we're just clearing through some of these PvE elements, uh, drawing out all these retainers, and just trying to clear on through. Now, we are going to be missing a few of the drops and uh, certain one-time enemies in this particular episode, and that's because I had a recording hiccup and lost some footage again. Apparently, Elaim Lois is just the absolute worst thing to ever happen to Dark Souls. It's got the worst challenge area, and it seems to just be completely cursed. It makes me lose tons of footage, and it's very frustrating to me, but I will press on. I am not doing a blind run this time, so it's not particularly bad. I can recover, and hopefully you won't notice the difference. It's just going to be a few items along the way that I missed over, and a bonfire that's already been activated. But aside from that, it should be the same exact experience as I commentate along. And I realized that I actually missed out on a pair of items my first time through, so I'm glad I could come back and cover that at the proper timing rather than having to kind of run around for a little bit to get back to that. These guys all fall quite nicely, and this retainer is a little jerk and kind of sits there waiting for you. But something that I missed out upon was that after the storm cuts out, you can actually head over here and grab two really interesting items. The Ring of the Embedded, which grants you a few stats based on how low your stats are, similar to the Chime of Screams. And this little baby right here, Dark Dance. That's actually one of the strongest spells that they added in all the DLCs. The idea of a Dark Wrath of the Gods with a actual projectile element as well. That's just a very powerful spell. Really, really strong, and I'm glad to see so- oh! <laughs> well, that was a bit wonky. But I am glad to see that they added some real utility to the Dark uh, Tree, because a lot of these spells that Dark Hexes really rely upon to deal a lot of damage are just that, just a lot of damage. There's only a few real utility spells, like Affinity, and I guess there are some of the buff spells, but those are very rarely seen, especially now that uh, self-buffs have been limited to one per person. So, again, just really nice to see some variety, something new, because Wrath of the Gods, we had that in Dark Souls 1. This Dark Dance, now that brings something extra to it. As you can see, I activated this bonfire already. For me, it's just going to serve as a checkpoint. I have no intention of taking this little coffin down there because honestly, this is this is this right here is the worst level that I've ever played in a Dark Souls game or even Demon Souls. It's it's just absolutely terrible and I cannot stand it. The enemies come out of nowhere and have nearly infinite poise. Uh, the level is designed incredibly poorly. It's just one of the laziest levels I've ever seen, and uh, it's not even very worthwhile. At the end of it is just a double boss, which has been a consistent problem throughout Dark Souls 2. It's a double boss that is a boss we've already seen before. It's just Ava copied twice. And that's just, ah, uh, that is frustrating. I will defend Dark Souls 2 as being the better game between Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2, However, it's not perfect, and that's one of the biggest problems it has. A lot of the bosses are somewhat samey, and when it messes up, it messes up big time. There's just no two ways about it. That was a lazy level. It was poorly put together, poorly thought out in general. And I just am really disappointed that FromSoft would release that as a DLC. Literally paid for content. Like... This isn't part of the regular base game. They had to go out of their way to... Oh my, really? I just want the backstab. 
I just want the backstabs. That's so much to ask. But they had to go out of their way to specifically create this level in order to... I don't know. Maybe it was because they were rushed to release on time, but I don't buy that. I think they would have just delayed a little bit longer. I don't honestly think that any studio is stupid enough to rush out a horrible product because of an arbitrary deadline. I just, I don't believe it. I think that they actually tried to do something new and unique, and they did. It is unique. I, I don't argue that. But what I argue is that it's bad. It's just, it's an awful level. The enemies in it are terrible, and the gimmick wears off after your first time through. And that's exactly what it is. It's just a gimmick. It's a quickly put together, horrible, horrible little level that I... Ugh. It makes me sad that it's in the game. I'll stop harping on it now because I think I've had my piece, but suffice it to say, I, I really dislike that level. As you can see, this is right about where I got to. I managed to unlock Durgo's hat over in that little repository over there. And from here, I decided to head downwards into the wall works of Elaine Lois. Roll past that, and here we are. These guys, as I've said before, are a little bit difficult, but if you can get behind them, you can sort of deal with them okay. I don't think that there's really any sort of good catch-all strategy for dealing with them, but they're manageable. I grabbed this plus eight priest chime, and that's where I found out that something was going wrong with the recording, so everything from here on in is going to be, again, completely fresh for us all. Uh, all the drops will still be there, all the single spawn enemies. I can take on everything as it comes once again. This Butcher's Knife, really fantastic weapon. Really quick swing speed, it's very high poise damage, and it just has a lot of just base damage and scaling as well. Roll back and get the backstab. I'm probably going to be missing my ability to do that in the near future, but uh, I, I, I won't spoil too much. Suffice it to say, I, I'm really glad that Dark Souls in general has this third-person camera for moments like that specifically. But let's head up and see what we can see up here. I believe there's one enemy... No, there's a drop of some nice Elizabeth mushrooms and it opens the shortcut. That's right. This leads us back over there to the exile chamber bonfire. It allows you to come straight back from there and head right back into the thick of it. I don't really think we're going to need to tag that bonfire because of my Estus is at a pretty high amount and the weapons I'm using aren't are at least varied enough that I'm not going to have a problem clearing through the level. This is a big, heavy poise, breaking weapon. This one is too. Uh, the Butcher's Knife has a health steal effect, so that's always great. Let's see if this can one-shot them on the backstab. I'd be really happy if it could. Nope. Nope, it looks like this is only a two-tick backstab, which is sad. Oh, excuse me. You gonna, you gonna drop that shield? There we go. Sometimes enemies like that can get a little bit frustrating, but... They're pretty simple if you just wait them out. I don't like waiting for enemies to drop their guard, but it's it's an understandable mechanic. And I wouldn't say it artificially lengthens combat. I think it more goes to either making you play smart or play hyper-aggressive by th trying to throw in some guard breaks. Bring out a nice little pokey weapon for these doggies here. It always helps to keep them at range. And if you can hit multiples at once, all the better. And it is a kind of nice little encounter they set up here. Where if you you know about it, or are paying attention from the holes above, you can know that there's a bunch of dogs down there. And that you pretty much want to take them out as soon as you get down here. But even if you clear that little section alright, there's still more down here to mess you up. And dogs are some of those really annoying enemies that I also think are done really well in Dark Souls in general. Uh, they have an interesting moveset and they reward you for being hyper-aggressive or turtling. And I think that that's how most enemies should be. 
they should have a clearly defined sort of setup where you're rewarded for going one way or the other. Flim flamming in between, uh, hesitating to make decisions, that's going to get you hurt. That's going to get you damaged. But kind of like with the way certain platformers are designed, it's set up so that if you just dedicate to one sort of style and you try and manage it that way, you're probably going to come out okay so long as you have the skills to actually back that up because that is something that is a bit of a problem is when a game doesn't reward you for a skillful play, but I don't think anyone is arguing that Dark Souls doesn't reward you for skillful play. I'm pretty sure most of us realize how untrue that would be to say. This, that's one of the reasons that, while I disagree with it, that situation right there is one of the reasons I can understand why they tried out infinite poise on some of the invaders, because by the time the player is coming up against them, they probably have a lot of stamina and probably have some sort of quick weapon like a spear or something, and you can stun lock them incredibly easy for your entire stamina bar worth of damage. I don't think that makes... I don't think that really goes to advocating for the idea of infinite poise enemies, but, you know, it's, it's certainly an option to fix a problem. And I think a lot of what they did with the DLC, as I've said before, is about making you change the way you played in the base game and sort of trying new solutions to old problems that came up when they released the game. I don't agree with all of their methods of handling that, but, you know, so it, it happens. I definitely, as a whole, love all three of these DLCs and really enjoyed my time spent with them, but I, I understand that they did make a few mistakes. It's not all fantastic, and the invaders are part of the problem. I think, honestly, Elayam Lois, this Ivory King DLC, is actually my least favorite of the three DLCs that were... Oh, this room. It's best just to aggro them once and then bugger off so that you can take as many of them out without bothering the uh, big golems in there as you can. Because you want to ideally be able to take out all of those golems while they're still asleep. And... It is possible, but it takes some finagling. This one, you can kind of keep in between you and the casters, but it, it doesn't work perfectly. And it also helps to take out this guy ahead of time so that he's not buggering you while you're, de uh, while you're dealing with all the enemies in there. As I was saying, uh, Elaine Voice is probably my least favorite of the three DLCs because I don't know. It doesn't seem to have as much, um, just as much new and unique to it as the other DLCs did. I kind of liked the way they changed up a lot of the ways you play the game in the other DLCs. And Elaine Lois just doesn't do that as much. It brings in a bunch of new enemies and really, really cool aesthetics. But I think the level design is a little bit beneath the other two DLCs. And I think that was the real problem with the base game, was that the level design wasn't incredible. It was good. I, I think that the base game definitely stands on its own merits, but I don't think it was quite as incredible as Dark Souls 1. And the DLCs really fixed that. Both uh, the... Uh, Sunken Crown and the Crown of the Old Iron King. Both of them have fantastic vertical levels with winding, twisting turns and everything joins in on itself and it kind of feels like a very connected uh, level. And Elaine and Lois kind of has that, but I would not say near the same degree as the other two. 
And I think that's what really made them stand out as being so much better than the base experience we got with Dark Souls 2. Which was great, but while it was mechanically better, some of the design elements were just not quite up to the par that Dark Souls 1 had set. And honestly, who can blame them? Dark Souls 1 was had been my favorite game of all time before Dark Souls 2 released. And while Dark Souls 2 has surpassed it slightly in my opinion, I still think they're very, very comparable games. And that anyone trying to say one is just the absolute best thing ever is probably talking from a place of ignorance or incredible bias rather than some place of knowledge take out all three of these guys at once. Again, major thanks to Furtive Cutlass. This whole place is so much easier once you realize that you can take out those golems without them actually triggering and coming to life. And that, that really makes that encounter a heck of a lot easier. It's also kind of how I cheese the rest of these areas, but I don't think it's quite cheese if it's a direct mechanic like that where it's just plain and simple, you can take the added risk of clearing the enemies beforehand, drawing them out in order to not have to face these guys in animate form. And if you do, you get rewarded with, again, not having to face them in animate form. It's a pretty simple reward, and I think it's a worthwhile one. If you take a little bit time to play a bit more methodical and really think about how you're engaging the enemies in a way to draw them out, you can clear through the area easier by having to face less of these difficult enemies because especially in these tight corners, these tight confined spaces, those golems are actually very, very difficult to take out. They've got a really great move set, and they can really bait you into being a bit over greedy. But that's the last of the Ilayum Knights of Elaim Lois, so I'm just going to grab a few secrets that are left in this level, and then we're going to be facing the Burnt Ivory King. Pretty much going to just head straight on into him, because as I'm not taking on the horrible challenge level, I have nothing else to complete. I've gathered up all the important drops and loot, or will soon be doing so, and from there, it's... Just a matter of beating the final boss, and that will conclude the more in-depth run of the Ivory King DLC. Bap, bap, oh, that last one should have hit. But I can switch out to my quick weapon, and I think that's going to be a really important part of how this build comes together, is quickly swapping between my heavy, medium, and light weapons to deal with certain situations that my opponents will be bringing up. Because once I actually head into higher-end PvP, I'm going in with pretty trash uh, defensive stats. My Vigor, Endurance, and Vitality are all just right around 20, so I'm going to have to rely heavily on dodging around and keeping up my offensive capabilities in order to really come out on top. Because while this is a level 200 build, and I think I've explained why I prefer the level 200 meta to the level 150 meta. At the same time... Ow, bollocks. At the same time, uh, it, it is a fair deal of stats. Like, it's nothing to scoff at. I think that it's more fitting, and it's more close to Dark Souls 1's level 120 meta, but at the same time, it does give you quite a bit of flexibility and allows you to take on two real uh, specializations, I would say, while still allowing you to get decent defenses, whereas I've taken upon this character to dedicate incredibly high to my offensive stats, and my defenses have suffered because of it. And with defenses this low, my options are pretty much gonna be fight or flight. I can't, I can't take a lot of hits, but I can certainly do my best to dish them out, and that's going to be the key idea in making this build work in actual PvP, is constantly bringing out different 
unique weapons to uh, mix, mess with the opponent, I suppose. More just to keep myself in a very versatile position. I'm considering what I want to bring into this fight, it's probably going to be the uh, Malformed Shell or Sanctum Nace. You know, considering how many of these guys there's going to be, I think the Malformed Shell would do me a little bit better because I don't want to poison myself. Um, any th Yeah, let's keep the Dark Drift as the light weapon in order to deal with their shields. And that leaves me one medium slot, so... Let's let's bring in the Bastard Sword. I think that its poise damage is going to be the really important factor because with this fight, it's not so much about taking on the knights just by dealing tons of damage. It's more about keeping them staggered long enough for your friendly knights to deal with them as well as you to kind of outlast it long enough for your knights to take out their spawners. It's very much a, ooh, already off to a bad start, but I think that I can, oh dear. The shields, the shields, here we go. Here we go. That, oh, directionality is just messing me up. It's one of the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's, let's, let's try that again. As I was saying, directionality is one of the benefits of using a massive great weapon like this, but it's also one of the handicaps. Because you have a very high control over the direction you're swinging, you, generally speaking, have a very poor turning radius when comboing. The original strike should be able to be aimed wherever you want to send it, but the follow-up swings, generally speaking, especially with really heavy strength weapons like this, kind of have to go in one way or another. Oh dear, I probably should have tried for the guard break critical, but goodness, I am really mucking this up. Let's, let's try and heal up and face these guys with my... Oh. Um... <laughs> You see, my knights, they are being real bros and kind of face tanking all this nonsense. The bow does pretty okay for range damage, but I don't think it's really what I need right now. Now that I've got this guy up in my face. There we go. There we go. Get nice combos in there. Just get all the way out of there now. They're no longer stun locked, so... I've got to take this chance to back off and heal. I might have considered coming in here with a parry shield, because these guys can actually be parried fairly nicely, and that's one of the only ways to actually get critical hits on them, as opposed to uh, guard break criticals, but as you can see, I'm not... Oh, dear. Let's, let's back off and see if we can get to a place where we can heal. Hopefully, we can... Oh dear. I was worried that fireball was going to catch me, but I managed to clear it. Oh, rolled too early. But, he goes down now. And I roll, and I get clipped by com both of those attacks, but he allows me to come back in on it, and we take him down. I just need to back off and heal some. There's only a few knights left, there's only one spawner that's up and running, so... If I can just kite around nicely and keep them locked down, I can be in a pretty nice place to face the Burnt Ivory King. Roll out. Grab the item just because no point in letting it sit there while I fight. Pancake him. Switch to a lighter weapon in order to just clip off that last bit of health. Oh, and he do drops a nice little Lois Soul. I, I haven't bothered with those yet, and I can't really foresee a time when I really decide to go for that. Because, honestly, the Lois Souls are just not worth the effort. Let's get some magic damage up in here, and slap on a green blossom before I go into this. And I'm pretty, pretty sure I'm set to take on the Burnt Ivory King now. He's gonna come out in all his flaming glory. I've still got... A nice little Alam Knight. Knight of Alam Lois on my side, backing me up. 
I've got a shield. I'm, I'm in a really great position to be taking him on. Roll out. There we go. Ooh. There we go. Oh, was not expecting the four hit combo. Back it all the way. Oh dear. I meant to Estus, and that was not Estus. Oh, and now he's dealing damage to my subordinate. I can't have that. But it doesn't look like there's a whole lot I can do. Looks like it's just mano a mano now. Just gotta rely on my dodging. The problem I think that this fight has is that the build-up is way too long for this much of a joke. The Burnt Ivory King is a very weak enemy with a very lackluster moveset. And while he can catch you off with some of his attacks, I don't think he's a particularly impressive foe, especially for the final fight in such a drawn-out encounter as this. I think the uh, build-up is a bit too great for this guy. And I mean, it makes sense because they don't want to be too punishing after having you fight through all of his knights, but it still doesn't make for very good gameplay, in my opinion. Heal on up, and now he's basically toast. Which, I guess, could be said of him before he started fighting me, given that he's the burnt Ivory King, but that's just a little bit of dark humor for you. And there we have it. I have his soul. I'm about to snag his crown. And I can finally return to Vendrick equip all my crowns and just have a little field day proud of myself and the fact that I am now immortal, sort of, ishly. The ending to these DLCs, eh, it's kind of interesting. But at the same time, I'm not really... I was hoping for something a little bit more grandiose and it makes sense that... I don't know. It makes sense that FromSoft wouldn't lock a new ending behind a paywall, but I was I was hoping for something a little bit more. Just, yeah, a little bit more, and I didn't get it, but that's okay. I Overall, I'm very happy with all the time and money I've spent with these DLCs, and I think they're a wonderful addition to the game. I highly recommend them to pretty much anyone out there who enjoys Dark Souls, and this has been my in-depth run of the final DLC. Thank you so much for watching. I've had an absolute blast. Consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. I would really like to engage down in the comments below, so don't be afraid to drop me a comment. I, I'd be happy to talk to you about all the wonderful things in Dark Souls. And again, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.